what a lively crowd. <laughs> Good afternoon. There really are more than 450 of you here today, uh, which is a record number. Uh, welcome. I'm Naomi Barron, the Executive Director of the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning, and we're absolutely Oh my word. Uh, and, we're, and we're absolutely delighted that you are here. 26 years and counting. That's how many years we have been running this conference. It's flown under different flags and had different names. We are delighted with the name we now have, namely Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning, sponsoring the Ann Farron. Now you get up to get, get, get to get up and get awarded. <laughs> the end, and you'll see Anne again in a moment. Um, the Anne Farron Conference on Teaching Research and Learning. I want to make sure that we have lots of times for the things we're really here to do, first and foremost, which is networking with your colleagues. And you've had a chance to do that to begin with. We have a speaker who I know will not just engage you with what he has to say, but with what you will ask of him, and we'll have some good conversation coming afterwards. We also have a number of awards to recognize a number of our colleagues who have done some pretty fantastic stuff. In addition to all the other fantastic stuff you do, but we don't have that many picture frames to go around. Uh, I'm not gonna go through with you what is in your folders, but what I would like to talk about is a couple of the new things that we are doing this year um, that we hope you will participate in. Don't pull it out now, just eat. <laughs> but there will be in your folder this nice um, flower, sunflower, call it what you will, advertising a program that we're just starting, a summer faculty institute. What the heck is that? We know that we can give a conference like this one day. We know that in August we can give some workshops and we have various other kinds of events. But a lot of what we'd like to do takes more time. I bet you can identify with that. So what we are trying out for the first time is having five different workshops, some are one day, some are two days, on topics that we hope will engage you, uh, will teach you new skills, will give you opportunities to move forward with your writing, with your, um, with your research abilities, with your technology in the classroom abilities, with your working with students and community-based learning and so forth, and with problem-based learning. So registration is now open, and I encourage you to take a look at this and register for what's interesting to you. A second new initiative that we started launching a little bit last fall, but now it's big, Open American. That sounds good, right? Um, open Educational Resources Initiative. This is an initiative that CTRL is working on with the Office of Campus Life as well as with the University Library to help faculty find creative ways to use course materials that don't all have to carry a $250 price tag. Uh, we actually have a little bit of money, not $250, well, we have a little bit of money, I'll leave it at that. Uh, all the information is available on our website. So that if you are interested in looking at ways of recrafting your course or courses, to make creative use of open educational resources, most of which is online, but you can also get some open stuff that is in hard copy for those of us who still believe in it. Um, and we will work with you. Where's Lucas Regner? There he is. Okay, Lucas is the one who's spirating uh, this initiative within CTRL, and all the information you need is on both our website and on this flyer. Okay. Uh, a third thing I just want to bring to your attention is the focus of our noontime conversations for the spring. Uh, for those of you who uh, joined us last fall, the focus of our conversation was, to some extent, what are student voices telling us about the curriculum, about the cost of textbooks, and so forth. This spring, the focus for our two events is going to be on what kinds of pedagogies have you maybe not thought of trying, but could be pretty interesting. They don't have to dominate your entire course, but it's a way of bringing in an element maybe you haven't worked on before. So we have two different noon, they're extended noontime conversations, so you get lunch plus a long amount of, of hands-on con of, of hands workshops and discussion. Uh, one is on problem-based learning, the other is on something called reacting to the past. And I'll just leave it at that. You can read the, the handout. Um, 
A very short thank you, thank you, thank you to all the people who made this possible. I know you say, okay, can we get on with the show? You're supposed to say thank you, but I really mean it. Um, thanks to the entire Ann Farron Conference Planning Committee. Who is here from the Planning Committee? Stand up and be recognized if you want to stand. Thank you. So if you say, what a terrific bunch of sessions, you have that Planning Committee in large part to thank. The members of the CTRL staff who have been working hard and continuing to work hard, anyone who's on the CTRL staff gets to stand. Some of you are already standing, some are over in different locations. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you to Avenues Catering. It's good food, and there'll be more where it came from, so stay tuned for that. To facilities management, setting all this up is no um, small endeavor. Uh, to AV in the library, and a very special thanks to Anna Olson, who thankfully is standing where I can see her, who really makes this conference happen. <laughs> and now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the provost of our university, Provost Scott Bass, who will welcome you. Good afternoon and welcome to the conference. This is in its 26th year, as Naomi has mentioned, is our most important faculty gathering. As we go about our daily routines, it's hard to interact across our different divisions, different units, and this is an opportunity for us to work together across those units and talk about our important trade, which is teaching and research. <coughs> And based on today's attendance, it really shows the interest of our faculty. The inaugural, <coughs> excuse me, the inaugural conf conference of the Ann Farron began in 1989, and it had 50 participants. Over the years, it's grown, and in 2005, we had 203 participants. Last year, there was 450 faculty in attendance. This is our largest faculty-wide gathering that we have on the campus and is a tribute to our profession. As we continue to position ourselves as a premier college-centered research university, this gathering remains as a critical faculty development activity. The intentional dialogue and sharing, thank you, of best practices among colleagues raises our collective ability to provide quality learning experiences for our students. Today, you'll be talking about uh, issues such as the changing technologies that are available to use in the classroom, about educating millennials and the differences in the generation of students we are serving as undergraduates. Of course, you'll be able to talk about some of our graduate students and doctoral student issues, about achieving diversity and, in and inclusion. Now, we've talked a lot about diversity, and we have diversified our student population on the campus. But the issue of inclusion, of truly building a welcoming campus that works with students across the wide range of diversity that exists now on our campus still remains a challenge and a work in progress and will be discussed in our sessions. Also, issues of integrating the liberal arts with career preparation is something that is fundamental to the academy and we'll always work to improve uh, our position. By the way, parenthetically, you should know we've just done a detailed analysis of this year's graduates, uh, af last year's graduates after six months, and we find that uh, just over 90% are either in graduate school or employed in a profession or career that's related to their undergraduate experience. That's an important achievement for the institution. Congratulations to all of you for that. We're introducing and exploring new pedagogical techniques, and a number of you using flipped classrooms or online instruction, and are using some of those modalities in the discussions today. And these are new techniques that will help enrich uh, the learning experience and provide more time for you in the classroom to really engage in dialogue with your students. And there are many other challenges in higher education today that such a forum allows us to discuss. It, today it is, is launch uh, plenary is um, lunch plenary is most appropriate in that there are questions about the role of liberal arts education that's taking place 
in dialogues across of the country. And I look forward to President Roth, who will be speaking on this subject, as we as an institution are committed to the liberal arts education and it remains deep in the AU's soul. Uh, before I close, I'd like to recognize uh, Professor Naomi Barron and her leadership for CTRL and the team that planned today's conference. Please give her a round of applause. <laughs> Additionally, I applaud each of you for your commitment on innovation in education and learning and as evident in your participation today. Please give yourselves a round of applause and thank you. Double thank you. <laughs> now comes one of the real pleasures of the year for me, namely um, giving out awards to people who um, from amongst us are doing all kinds of fascinating things. I will say one thing before we begin. If you say, I'm doing interesting things too, good, keep it up. In some cases, get someone to nominate you, or for one of the awards, nominate yourself. You have a whole year to work on this. <laughs> and you'll hear a little bit about some of the people that we're recognizing today. We're giving out uh, four kinds of awards. One, I'll just tell you the names of the awards and then we'll bring the recipients up one by one. The Milton and Sylvia Greenberg Scholarship, uh, the Milton and Sonia Greenberg Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Award, the Ann S. Farron Curriculum Design Award, the Teaching with Research Award, and Teaching with Technology Award. Uh, the first recipient is um, Professor Bridget Marr from the School of Communication, uh, the winner of the Milton and Sonia Greenberg Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Award. I'll begin with regrets from Milton Greenberg, after whom, amazingly enough, in part, along with his wife, this, ex this uh, award is named. Um, he is in good spirits, but um, has just had some health issues and sends all of his good vibes to you. So if you feel the walls vibrating just a little bit, that is Milton. Uh, the Milton and Sonia Greenberg Scholarship of uh, Teaching, and okay, I'm gonna do this so the photographs work, right? You have to stay. You can't go in here. <laughs> you can stay on this side. Okay, but you hold on. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what the award's about, right? Recognizes AU faculty have made a significant contribution to research-based analyses of teaching practices or of curricular design. This year's winner is Bridget Marr from the School of Communication. Professor Marr is acknowledged for her contributions in researching and designing an online curriculum for the School of Communications Graduate Certificate in Digital Media. Her integration of the theories behind new methods of conveying information into the design of these courses has provided students with cutting edge digital skills training and opened up new career paths for them. So now you get to have a <laughs> And I'm not going to be in every photograph, just consider me Milton Greenberg, <laughs> which is a hard act to follow. Um, the 2014 Ann S. Farron Curriculum Design Award. Ann, come on up, if you would. Along with the recipients, of which there are three, uh, Professor Patrick Jackson, Professor Rose Shinko, and Professor Elizabeth Cohen, all from the School of International Service. But you need a good backdrop. So what is this award all about? The NS Farron Curriculum Design Award recognizes creative integration of the learning outcomes of the general education program into the design of an undergraduate major or interdisciplinary program. The 2014 winners are a team of faculty from the School of International Service, Professors Patrick Jackson, Roshenko, and Elizabeth Cohen. Together, they reconceptualize the structure of the undergraduate curriculum in international studies. 
The revised BA program lucidly reflects integration of the goals of the general education program, illustrating the team's understanding of both curriculum alignment and the role of meaningful assessment. Congratulations to you all. Anne applauds you as well. <laughs> Thank you kindly. The next award is the 2014 Teaching with Research Award. Uh, Professor Maria de Jesus from the School of International Service. <laughs> you get to come over here, so I'm told. CTRL's Teaching with Research Award recognizes faculty who creatively incorporate original student research activities into course experience. The 2014 winner of the award is Professor Maria de Jesus from the School of International Service. Professor de Jesus used her recently funded research project on HIV and HIV prevention among African American and African immigrant women in DC to engage and connect her students to the entire research process. Students analyzed a subset of Professor, uh, Professor de Jesus' interview results, learning how to interpret data in order to make valid claims, as well as developing their own mentored research projects. Congratulations. Our last award is the Jack Child Teaching with Technology Award. For those of you who don't know the name Jack Child, he was the founding director of what was then called the Center for Teaching Excellence. He also cared incredibly, as I'm sure many of you know, about technology. We have named the award after him. We have two winners, uh, one of whom is homesick with the flu, Professor Brian Yates. That's why we had to cancel his session this morning. But he also is making the walls vibrate, so I promise you he's here with us. And I will read the recognition for why we are recognizing him. First, what is the award about? CTRL's Jack Child Teaching with Technology Award honors faculty who have demonstrated creativity in using technology in their teaching. Our winners for 2014 are, and now we have our second winner, Professor Dylan, uh, Dean Freelon. Uh, come on over here. Make the photographer happy. Thank you kindly. Um, in the School of Communication and Professor Brian Yates from the Department of Psychology and CAS. We recognize Dean Freelon for not having the flu and, <laughs> and for his innovative technology-centered approach to teaching students how to use specialized software to analyze big social media data sets. Professor Freelon has developed his own research tool called Recal and available to his students and challenge students to develop their own automated text reclassification algorithms. We also recognize Professor Brian Yates for his career-long innovative use of technology in teaching. Among the tools that Professor Yates was among the first to adopt at American University are, first of all, lugging an original Mac to class. Second, bringing the web into the classroom through internet-connected laptops using learning management systems such as Blackboard to flip the classroom, creating ebooks to curate course reading lists, and use of the iPad in teaching. So my congratulations to <laughs> and thank you all. And now, it's an incredible pleasure to introduce President Michael Roth from Wesleyan University. You get to sit while I do the talking, but it won't be long. Michael S. Roth became the 16th president of Wesleyan University in 2007. Earlier, he had served as Hartley Burr Alexander Professor of Humanities at Scripps College, Associate Director of the Getty Research Institute, and President of the California College of the Arts. At Wesleyan, President Roth has enriched learning opportunities by overseeing the launch of the Al Britton Center for the Study of Public Life, the Shapiro Creative Writing Center, and four new colleges emphasizing interdisciplinary research and cohort building, the College of the Environment, the College of Film and the Moving Image, the College of East Asian Studies, and the College of Integrative Sciences. There's also Michael Roth, the author and curator, most notably of the exhibition Sigmund Freud, 
Conflict and Culture, that opened here in Washington at the Library of Congress in 1998. Dr. Roth describes the scholarly interest as centered on, quote, how people make sense of the past, end of quote. His fifth book, Memory, Trauma, and History, Living, Essays on Living with the Past, was published in 2012. Besides his presidential and scholarly responsibilities, he continues to teach undergraduate classes through Coursera, and he has offered MOOCs, including one called How to Change the World. But in his most recent thinking, presented in his book, Beyond the University, Why Liberal Education Matters, it's for that book and that thinking that makes Pre Pre uh, President Roth an excellent relevant speaker, an especially relevant speaker at today's gathering. The book is a plea for the kind of education that has, since the founding of the nation, cultivated individual freedom, promulgated civic virtue, and instilled hope for the future. Like all liberal arts institutions, American University continues to grapple with the very hard question of what kind of education makes sense in contemporary times. Having read Why Liberal Education Matters Beyond the University, flip the order of those, please, I know that we have much le to learn from President Roth. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you all for being here. What a great crowd. If, if I saw this many of my own faculty in one room, I would be in trouble, I know. <laughs> it would not be a happy moment. For, don't tell, you, but this isn't being recorded, is it? Uh, so here we go. So uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. I, I don't, you've all been working uh, in sessions and, 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 and um, focused on important things in teaching and learning. Uh, I, I think we all agree on a few things, probably. But one thing we would all agree on, I believe, I'm just going to take this out of my, away from the microphone, is that uh, freedom of expression uh, is uh, vital for any serious form of education. To be able to speak without fear, to be able to write, to be able to draw without fear, to be able to um, Try out ideas that will piss people off, that will amuse them, that will frustrate them, that will offend them. And uh, while you were working, I was glued to my television set this morning. Uh, the um, alleged uh, killers of the journalists have uh, at uh, Charlie Hebdo have been uh, killed. Uh, four hostages have also been killed this morning in, in Paris uh, uh, and uh, other uh, suspected assailants. I feel like I could just not talk about the history of uh, liberal education, but instead talk about what issues this raises for us. I wrote a, a, you know, a blog, like many of you, um, a tweet or blog, and uh, I, I put up a, a, a picture of myself uh, with a Je suis Charlie uh, uh, piece of paper the other day. Uh, and one of my esteemed uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Professor Emeritus, wrote in to my blog this morning, said, uh, Roth, why don't you go out and say that these were Islamic extremists who killed people? You're a coward. And I thought, there we have it. So many issues in liberal education raised by, I think, the hatred he expresses in his writings more generally and in his comment on my blog more specifically. Um, and in the questions of what counts as audacity for presidents, well, that's a low bar, but for faculty, <laughs> for faculty, for, uh, for us teachers. And so what do I do? I post his comment, because I don't have to. Because what else would I do? having said that, what I said when I started, even though I find that common hateful. I post it, and now I will receive sponsors saying, you've posted something that's hateful. So many of the issues we grapple with, when we grapple with serious things in education, and God knows I hope we do, are right in this moment here. Uh, but I'm a historian, 
And although I could sit and talk with you about this moment here, I probably don't know as much as many of you about it. So instead, I'll talk about my book, about which I know more than any of you. Perhaps, perhaps Naomi uh, is the exception, because she's read it more recently than I. Um, um, uh, and, and so I wanted to talk to you uh, about the history of the commitment to liberal education in the United States. Uh, and and uh, I think, in a way, that will be connected to what we're living right now. Because, because if, if liberal education isn't connected to the way we're living now, it deserves to die. I really, I really believe that. I, I don't think we should do this uh, uh, merely out of antiquarian interest. My, my uh, teacher as an undergraduate was Hayden White at Wesleyan, and uh, antiquarianism was something we talked about through the prism of Nietzsche. It's not something you value uh, uh, except for the pleasure it might give you, the fetishistic pleasure, he would have said, um, uh, in the present. I believe liberal education is relevant to these issues in the present, and I think it's more relevant now than it's ever been. And I'll tell you a little bit why. So there are four moments in uh, my story. They go under the words liberate, animate, cooperate, and instigate. I was very proud of myself. I was sitting in front of an audience in Beijing when I uh, came up with that rubric. Of four, and I was very surprised. I thought there'd be 27 people there. There were not as many as you, but there were a few hundred people who came to hear a talk on liberal education. So I thought I'd come up with some other way of slicing it up. And you know, I thought it would, I'd sound like a kind of hip American as I was rhyming. My translator was less amused. Um, but the audience was even less amused, because of course it didn't rhyme in Chinese at all. Um, as she pointed out to me, only after the talk did I realize that this was a, a, a unnecessary affectation on my part. Uh, liberate. I'll start off with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, is the, the figure I spent some time uh, on uh, in Beyond the University because he represents a commitment to education as a path of inquiry that allows you to make choices upon graduation, let's say from a college, rather than education as a procedure that directs you to what you already know is going to happen. The latter is what he associated in his time with Harvard. And Jefferson's commitment, as has been the commitment of so many uh, great educators in this country over the last few hundred years, his commitment was just don't be like Harvard. Right? And so he, in creating the University of Virginia, really thought it was key that students determined their lives after graduation on the basis of the questions they asked rather than on the basis of the choice they made before they asked the questions. And that's, of course, relevant to all of us today in colleges and universities when students come and say, I want to be X. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm majoring in business. Right? Now, that's, that's actually a brave thing to do today. Anybody here from the business school? Yeah, that's a, brave, that's a brave thing to do, because everybody in business says, what, are you crazy going to college for business? You shouldn't go to college for business. Why are you going to college? You should go to, you should go to San Francisco, <laughs> or Detroit, or to Boston. You should go someplace where you can hatch your own idea, get a better pizza more quickly, find a better driver than the Uber drivers. Do something really that will be an example of your own creativity. You don't need anybody else to tell you what they did if you're going into business. So many people say today, you don't belong in school because you already know what you want to do. The Jeffersonian view, the view under the rubric of liberation is you go to school to find out that you don't know yet what you are going to do, and you will discover that bits and pieces through the educational process itself. In other words, education isn't what you choose to fulfill a destiny or your parents' destiny. Education is something you pursue in order to open up possibilities, choices for you in the future. Jefferson wrote to Adams, uh, uh, his frenemy, I guess my daughter tells me I should say, um, um, uh, uh, that ours will be the follies of enthusiasm, not bigotry. We're not here to indoctrinate. 
We are here to liberate the mind. Self-reliance and autonomy. Now here I am in Washington, D.C. at a very progressive school, I'm told, American University. I'm told that, uh, um, uh, that when, when people talk about politics here in the classroom, um, they mostly are talking about uh, the, um, the, 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 the failures of the Obama administration to live up to its potential um, and, and things to the left of that. That, that was a joke, so I'm glad some of you are laughing. Some of you are like, yeah, what's wrong with that? Uh. <laughs> and so when I talk about Thomas Jefferson, that first thing you think of is probably not liberate and enlightenment and self-reliance. You think of Sally Hemings, you think of racism, you think of slavery, as well you should. What was fascinating to me about um, uh, Jefferson's views on education, uh, and I urge you to read the book. <laughs> My mother told me to do that. Uh, uh, is that those ideas are taken up in short order by the very people who Jeff, to, to whom Jefferson denied the benefits of this kind of education. So uh, I was very interested to, to uh, write about David Walker, a free black who lived in New England and who wrote a pamphlet urging his uh, fellow uh, black slaves and free blacks in uh, the North to throw off the yoke of slavery, to rebel against their masters, to do that with violence, but also with and through education. And so for David Walker, freedom came through liberation, the liberation of education. So he writes against Jefferson, but he writes in this Jeffersonian mode. And I'm going to read you a quote. I, I did brought this up here just so I, I, I wouldn't have to paraphrase David Walker in 1829. Are we not men, he wrote. We are, because we can learn. Right, just right out of the Enlightenment and, and right out of Jefferson. I pray that the Lord may undeceive my ignorant brethren, David Walker wrote in his appeal, and permit them to throw away pretensions and seek after the substance of learning. And here is a professor who warms my heart. He says, I would crawl on my hands and knees through mud and mire to the feet of a learned man, where I would sit and humbly supplicate him to instill into me that which neither devils nor tyrants could remove. Only with my life. For colored people to acquire learning in this country makes tyrants quake and tremble on their sandy foundation. 1829. For colored people to acquire learning in this country makes tyrants quake and tremble on their sandy foundation. The bare name of educating the colored people scares our cruel oppressors almost to death. Yeah. Yeah, still. I think that a lot of this rhetoric about why are you in school? You're from an underrepresented group. Why are you in school? Uh, you're a, a girl. You don't deserve school. Why are you in school? You have a different path. I think a lot of this rhetoric is about trying to keep people from thinking because when people think, they challenge the status quo. And David Walker, when he made that appeal, for which his, he, you know, his, it was a price was put on his head, uh, uh, in, in uh, Alabama, they said, uh, we, you know, dead or alive, we'd prefer him alive so we can torture him to death. He, 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 he was felled by tuberculosis, not by the uh, southern aristocracy. But for David Walker, and for I think so many of our students today, here and around the world, education is connection, connected to liberation. My second beat, second moment, animate. I have to be quick, I know, because I, I promise to leave you time for questions. But uh, animate, I have to say a word about Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, because it's just so much fun to talk about the, uh, the sage of Concord, that to talk about his critique of educational institutions. So Emerson, um, again, Harvard, <laughs> he goes up to Harvard to talk to them. And, and you know, his basic message is, get the hell out of school. You should not be in school because school is indoctrination. And what it's indoctrinating you into is a pattern of subservience. What you are learning to do is to feel less and to think more narrowly. That's what school is about. Emerson said, no to that form of education. 
And what kind of education did he have in mind? An education that would make the world more alive for you. And he said is, uh, maybe I have it, maybe I have it, um, um, yeah. Education is setting souls aflame. I'll give you another quote. Um, uh, Colleges say, serve us when they aim not to drill, but to create. Aim not to drill, but to create. Tell that to your assessors when they come to assess you and your learning goals. I know I'm supposed to like these things. <laughs> How do you assess the ability of a student to make the world more alive? It'd be a good, it's a good question. I don't think it's impossible to answer. But for Emerson, liberal education was about seeing things in the world to which you were blind before. Hearing music that you, used to be just noise for you. Seeing creativity where you only saw perversion or idiosyncrasy. What Emerson meant by animation was opening up one's intellectual and cultural horizons so that the world is more alive for you because you have made the world more alive. We've all, I trust, we've all had students for whom this has happened, and we've seen in our classrooms, whatever you're teaching, students who were just not able to, to get something because it just didn't register on them. And then because of the book you're reading or the science you're practicing or the music you're, you're, you're working with, suddenly it's alive for them. And for Emerson, that meant you are more alive, too. You are more alive, too. The desire to animate the world for Emerson was at the core of what a liberal education should be. The third moment that I want to spend a little bit more time on is um, uh, cooperate. Because uh, on the rubric of cooperation, uh, we have a group of thinkers who agreed in large part with Jefferson and Walker and Emerson, they agree that education should make you freer, help you stand on your own two feet, make you self-reliant, open the world to experience. But they worried that the way we did education focused so much on the individual student and that the American cultivation of individualism is, as Dewey said, pathological. The rejection of interdependence as a form of uh, maturity is a disease, Dewey argued. But before I talk more about Dewey, I want to say a word about um, Jane Addams, who was denied the kind of college education you offer here and that, that we are so devoted to. Uh, Jane Addams wanted to go to Smith. Um, in the late 1800s, and, uh, um, and uh, her father said, no, you're, uh, you're a girl, you, you know. Um, uh, and she, she, you know, Smith was only for women then. Uh. <laughs> okay. You don't read the New York Times Magazine, okay. Um, so um, so she, didn't want, she, wanted to go to, she wanted to go to Smith, and um, her father said, no, you're going to go to a, a religious uh, school nearby. She goes there, she excels greatly, she, um, she's the editor of the paper, she's doing fantastically well, um, and uh, she says, I want to go to Smith now, I've paid my dues, I show I can do it, and um, daddy says, no, 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 you're, you're still a girl, um, so you don't belong in school, a school like that. She wants to become a doctor. Uh, and then he died. And so here she could, she gets all the money. She can go to Smith. Now, I've spent most of my life studying Freud and Freudian things, so I wasn't surprised that, in fact, she decides, of course, I can't have to obey my father because the most powerful father is a dead father. Um, and and, uh, and uh, Jane Addams decides I shouldn't go because I'm a girl. So instead, she embarks on a kind of alternative education because she has all this money. She goes to Europe. She does the grand tour. She reads voraciously. She's uh, off the chart smart and open-hearted, open-minded, and, and taken in the world, and has the money to do it um, in a capacious way. 
And then one day, one day she's, she's, she's uh, in London. I think I have this right. She's in, she's in, uh, she's in, she's in, I mean, I'm so used to talking to first year students. So I can make things up all the time. Here I'm, I'm, I'm a very little, very nervous talking to faculty. And it's like, a, she's probably a Jane Addams biographer here somewhere. What the hell is he talking about? Anyway, sorry. That's what's so dangerous about the MOOCs I teach, because I always teach freshmen in, on campus, and I put up as a MOOC, and people with PhDs, uh, with specializations in these areas. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> so Jane Addams, this is, uh, this is all going to come back together. Jane Addams is uh, uh, walking down the street in London, and she sees a guy get hit by a, a, a cab, a horse-drawn cab, knocked into the street. He's injured. So what does she do? She thinks of a poem by de, de Musset, who is citing a ver some, some passages from Homer about an accident and a person who fails to respond. So Jane Addams is standing there on the curb, seeing a suffering right in front of her. And then she goes through this circuit of, of learning. And she says, holy moly, or words to that effect, my education has destroyed my capacity for action in the world. I'm so smart, I can think of Demusay on Homer on um, tragedy, and I have not reached out to help this person who's been injured. I have, as she puts it so beautifully, lumbered my mind with literature. Lumbered my mind with literature so that I'm un incapable of acting. Why don't we have an education that empowers us to act? Empowers us to act. And so she comes home from her touring and her education. And of course, she opens a whole house. And she writes about the ways in which what we should do in education is not just empower people as individuals, but we should empower people as individuals in such a way that they see their connections to other people. She has a beautiful essay called The Modern Lear, where she talks about how we're so good at teaching people how to be critical. You know, even in the early 20th century, now we're really good at it. Like, you probably have courses in advanced snarkiness, right? <laughs> Not in the business school. That would, be in, that would be in communications, right? OK. Come on, work with me. Um, so so, so, uh, so Jane, Jane Adams realizes that we teach people how to see through arguments, you know, how to, how to uh, expose a, a speaker's uh, uh, fallacies, uh, bad arguments. Uh, but what we don't do, enough, she says, is to teach people how to understand the arguments from the other person's point of view. How to sit, put yourself in that person's position. This is right out of William James' essay uh, called, uh, talks to teachers called On a Certain Blindness in Human Beings. I'd love to talk about that, but I don't have time. But it's right out of James, and it's really connected to W.E.B. Du Bois, two other people I write about in the book, who see education as empowerment but empowerment that includes the sympathetic function rather than the function of competitive advantage, which we teach our students and we practice as institutions. Right? I'm walking around the school saying, yeah, I wonder if I should do that at Wesleyan. Should I tell them about my new plan for revamping the curriculum, or will they do it first? <laughs> competitive advantage. It's an American disease, too, especially when you're not very good at it becomes a real disadvantage when all you do is talk about it. Um, uh, instead, Adams, Du Bois, William James, this branch of pragmatism talked about empowerment as being perfectly in harmony with empathy, with cooperation, with paying attention to people who are suffering. How would it be if we in liberal education talked less about distribution of credits and more about whether our students can distribute their affections in ways that make them better neighbors, citizens, effective members of a community. Adams worried that as our education got more sophisticated, not only did we dry people up, as Emerson worried, but we kept them apart from each other. Smart people are very good at recognizing the reasons why they shouldn't do something. You have to go beyond that when liberal education is wedded to cooperation, as it was by James, by Jane Addams, by W.B. Du Bois, by Dewey, who says um, in an essay called Problems uh, on Recovery of Philosophy, 
uh, Dewey says that philosophy will die and should die if it doesn't deal with the problems of human beings. I could quote him exactly, but Dewey was, um, well, I think Oliver Wendell Holmes said, the God would speak in the language of John Dewey, which, you know, because Dewey was so smart, but, but if God were inarticulate. <laughs> So Dewey, Dewey's a clumsy, a clumsy writer most of the time. Not all the time. He wrote so much you can find a few pearls. Uh, but the basic point is so important that the empowerment that comes from studying philosophy or business or history or communications or technology or, uh, or foreign languages uh, or biology or physics, the empowerment that comes from that should be an empowerment that leads to cooperation and enhanced ability to deal with the real problems off campus beyond the university, not the problems of professors. We do have the illusion sometimes, we in the academy, that by teaching our own field, we are not being vocational in our instruction. By making believe the students in our classes are actually going to go on and become uh, advanced workers in our own field, that somehow we're not being vocational. We are being vocational, we're just being um, uh, unconsciously vocational and asking for imitators rather than for inquiry. What Dewey wanted us to do in our educational system, both in the K through 12 and, and university system, was to direct the wide ranging, broadly conceptual and contextual approach that is liberal education to problems that are recognized as real off campus and not just the problems that are recognized by professors. My last moment is uh, instigate. And Dewey was certainly an instigator. You know, Dewey, uh, like many of us, uh, had to fight off those people who were looking at college education uh, as a pathway to uh, uh, a job. And so they wanted it to be as narrow as possible, as quick as possible, and so they can plug right into a job. And, and Dewey, Dewey had an a, a, a interesting perspective on this because Dewey thought education was all about creating habits of mind and action that would be tested in the world. He, 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 he really, you know, as a pragmatist, he was all about what you're going to do in the world that shows the value of your education. But Dewey thought, as Jefferson did, that it was an infringement on the freedom of the students to insist that they take a track to fit into a system that had already assigned them a place. And that, as he put it, he knows everyone needs a job in the industrial regime. He just doesn't love the regime enough to give them exactly the job training that uh, captains of industry in his day thought they needed. And I, I don't. <laughs> I don't think that's uh, any different. He said that in 1918. Um, I don't think it's any different if you say that you know the captains of industry come from uh, Silicon Valley, that so they value freedom. That's I think that's just nonsense. Uh, they value imitation. They they call entrepreneurship um, the creation of more people like themselves, um, and um, are, and devalue a broad education that would allow the challenge of the status quo. And the challenge of the status quo is what I mean by instigation. So we want our students to know enough by the time they get to college and university to rebel against what they've been taught, to rebel against you. They certainly rebel against the president. That's a given. Um, you don't have to be Freud to figure out why. Um, but instigating change is what we want our students to be more capable of when they graduate, when they go beyond the university. That is a hard thing to do in a time like our own when many students are m eager to conform. By the time we get them in colleges and universities, they have proven their worth by doing well on tests. The whole point of that is just figure out what the test taker wants to hear and tell her or him, including using her and him in that order, because that's what people want to hear. 
So to do that kind of thing, to conform to the ethos around you, is what we've drilled our students in. And I don't know how many of you get this, and I, I'm always shocked at Westing because we have this reputation for radicalism, that you know, students will come up to you know, say, what's the prompt? And you're asking them to write a poem. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I say sexual arousal <laughs> is the prompt. And then they look at me and they, they start filling out a form. <laughs> I don't actually say that. My, the lawyers at Wesleyan are like spinning around in their offices, not their graves. Um, but can you, uh, th but our job in a climate where they are asking us for the tools to conform, and that happens a lot. I'm sure, I know it happens a lot. I, I, um, uh, for you as it does for our uh, folks uh, at Wesleyan, our job is to remind them of the pleasures of aversive thinking, to use Emerson's phrase, of the originality and the, the frisson, the, the, the beauty, the thrill of going against the grain. We have to sometimes dress that up and say that, and that will also help you get a job, and that will also help you do these things, impress people. That's true, and I do that, too. But to insist that liberal education is not a collection of disciplines, as it had been in Europe. Liberal education is a mode of thinking that inspires inquiry that is going to be liberating, animating, inspire cooperation, and if successful, incite our students to not just make our classrooms better, but to make the world of beyond the university a better place. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. I don't know. Uh, I'm not. Um, no, I know. I. I, I know. It's open. It was the, the, the hand that your hand went up first. I did. See, at least I saw it first. Okay. Testing. We saw you on a documentary done by CNN on, re in, on crisis in higher ed that um, focused largely on Cooper Union, trying to finish um, many years of history of a free education. And you were bravely there meeting parents, leaving oh, yes. their children <laughs> at Wesleyan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a father raised his hand and said, Will my student have a job in four years? No, he, he, what he, thank you, you're, you're close. But what he said was, uh, I want to know, President Roth, if in four years my daughter will be coming home and living at home, or will she have a job? <laughs> and to your credit, you didn't really give a firm. Well, they cut out my no. answer. Oh, okay. Well, here's they actually my cut out my answer. They, <laughs> they kept part of it, in, and, I'm, and, and I'm, I apologize because there's no way you could know that. Yeah. Uh, but my answer, which I thought was pretty funny at the time, was <laughs> because his daughter was sitting right next to him, and she was mortified, and everybody left, and she went like this. So I said, there's no question she won't be coming home. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. And Andrew Rossi, humorless Andrew Rossi, who was... Uh, you know, um, uh, no, nah, he's not humorless. But I thought I, I was so sorry because I thought it was kind of funny, and, and, and I was, and then I gave my 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 shtick. But uh, yes, yeah. my other shtick. Yeah. <laughs> this is my question. I'm sorry. What are you telling? <laughs> <laughs> what are you telling parents? Are we know our students yeah. are very close to their parents. They labor under their expectations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Education is so expensive. Um, yeah. How is this audience of parents and students hearing? your message, are you changing hearts and minds? What is that going forward? That's a great question. The, 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 um, uh, I, I, do have, I do argue in, this, in, in the book and every time I meet with parents that this kind of education is creating more opportunity and deeper problem solvers than the one they think they, sh they need to get. And um, I, I do, I, the, 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 the last chapter of the, of the book, and if you get there, you get a prize. You, you get a, my brother sends you a flower. Um, uh, the last chapter of the book is about pragmatic liberal education. I really believe the pragmatic part is key. That's why I actually don't use the words liberal arts in the, very often in the book, because liberal arts, they kind of connote that some things belong in and some things don't. I, I, I take the pragmatist view, you could teach anything, 
for, with, for, with a, a liberal framework, by which I mean conceptual, contextual, and showing the interconnection between what you're studying and other things. That ability today is so prized by whether you want to go into not-for-profit work or you want to go into investment banking and consulting, the things that every, well, the freshmen say, I would never do that. And all the seniors say, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and and they, they will be able to be more uh, resilient, creative, um, and uh, uh, insightful because of a broad in education. I don't think they should have this education so they can, uh, as, as Ben Franklin said about the Harvard students, they know how to walk out of a room backwards. Like, you know, that was the big thing you learn in Cambridge. Um, that's not worth saving. I think what's worth saving is a mode of education that empowers students to make a difference upon graduation. That means we have to give them the tools to translate the liberal education, whether they're English majors or chemistry majors or religion majors or communications majors, to translate that into what they're going to do after they graduate. That is different from when I was in school. I think the professors felt no such uh, uh, obligation. Uh, and, and of course, I, I was going on to graduate school, so I, I, I was like, you know, fine. I, I was I was moving in that direction, but I think today showing students how to translate from the study of poetry to other things is part of what we do. And when we do that, I, I employers tell me all the time that they will have a great advantage in the marketplace. Cost is a huge issue, um, and I, I think that um, you know one of the things driving uh, the sticker price of colleges up uh, uh, is, and I'm just stealing this from President uh, Catherine Hill at, at Vassar, is uh, more inequality in the country. As you have a group of super rich people who will pay whatever it takes to send their kids to school, schools will respond to that. The incentive is <laughs> build another building, put another facade on the building. What's the educational payoff? Nobody knows. What's the payoff with parents? I can measure that. Where's the development officer? She's probably busy. Um, so I, I think that um, um, figuring out how to offer a really great education much more efficiently is part of our obligation as faculty members, not just as a president. I teach a MOOC not because I'm president, but because I wanted to learn how to teach in a different format. So I've been doing the same thing so long. Uh, and I, MOOCs aren't the answer, but some version of those kinds of classes will be helpful to lots of people, not everyone in the future. So I think that a dealing with the cost issue is a, is a, is a major national uh, task. As President Wesleyan, I deal with that by trying to raise money for financial aid. And we've uh, pledged uh, a few years ago now to, to keep our tuition increases to, to CPI. And we've done that. Uh, I was wrong, though. I thought all the other schools would, would say, oh, we're going to do that, too. And nobody else is doing it. So my tr board is saying, like, what the hell's wrong with you? you know, why don't you charge? People will pay just to have more financial aid. And that's the model, I think, that has put us in such difficulty. But it is definitely the strongest model out there right now. There was a hand back here first, yeah. Or what you started with, it's so hard not to think about what's going on and in France. And I think what, as I'm sure you recognize, what you were saying, I think, does directly speak to that. Um, you're, I think you're, I completely agree. Ideas don't have a, a great deal of importance in the abstract. It's how they apply to what's going on. I think the people doing these horrendous things are antithetical to what you're talking about. So I appreciate what you're saying about that. And I appreciate how you started. I also appreciate what you just said about, about tuition. I mean, something you hear from students all the time. And yeah. what you said, national problem is correct. Let's go up to my question. I'm curious, so you're a historian, so maybe you'd answer it from this perspective, and that's fine. But I'm curious, do you, are there examples right now of universities that you think are doing the things you're talking about well, or are there are historical examples? I mean, your book pretty clearly seems to draw on some historical examples. Where there, and people tend to romanticize the past, so I don't want to do that, but were there times in the past when things were done better? Are there examples now that you think are good ones? Uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. I don't think there is one answer to this. I mean, I, I think uh, the kind of students you get at American University, and you get at Wesleyan, and you get, and it will be different from the uh, President Obama's plan announced yesterday, or at least gesture at a plan uh, to have you know community colleges free for everybody. That's a, that's a, that's a different thing. Um, if if we made a commitment to take 30 percent of our students from community colleges, that would be revolutionary. Don't hold your breath. And I haven't done it either. You know, we we we're taking a lot more, and we're you know we have a program, but. 
I think expanding access in the, in the, in, is going to have an impact on how much we're willing to spend on individual students. It's a little different but than talking about cost. Let me say uh, just another word about that. Um, the, the, uh, when I sit around with the, uh, uh, Co the Kofi schools, these very wealthy Ivy League schools and, and private liberal arts colleges and a few others, um, uh, they, they, they intend to spend more money per student. That's their model. And they're spending seventy-five dollars to uh, $95,000 per student. And they're very proud of it. They're, they speak more. They, they, some of the schools still actually advertise that to their alumni. Um, and the incentives are in place, the tax incentives and other things to do that. I, I think it's, it's an it's a, a awful thing. I think you can offer a first-rate education, not for $10,000 but for a lot less than, than 80. Um, and so um, uh, I think you do need policy changes to change incentives so that schools that have the capacity can experiment with more modestly uh, cost, more modestly priced uh, options that still uh, uh, will be part of their identity, will still have the quality there they expect. So it's very different, I want to be careful, it's very different from the Texas, uh, we could have a $10,000 degree uh, you know, it's like when you get into a $10,000 helicopter built in Texas. I, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. So, I mean, you get, at some point you get what you pay for, but only at some point, because after a certain point, the marginal utility of those extra dollars, which we are paying for with subsidies to those schools, schools like mine, uh, uh, that, that, that's, I think, that should change. But the forces to change that are really strong. Sorry. Um, yes? Lucky you. <laughs> so I went to McGill. My tuition was $19 a credit. Yeah. Right now, I mean, the student rebelled uh, a year and a half ago, yep. two years ago, when the tuition increase was to go up to 3000 yep. from 1800 But again, the whole structure of publicly funded universities versus the United States. But there, the education system is not bad. It's very good. So yeah. the question is, does it mean the whole fabric of the country and society is different? Yes. Uh, you know, and it's Canadian. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, be, I mean in, in, the, in other words, the fact that they don't charge very much for credit doesn't tell you anything about how much it costs. It just, it just the cost is hidden, and it's borne by the taxpayers generally. Um, and so it doesn't mean. It, Usually, even the Cana it does allow more access, but even the Canadian government is not known for being extraordinarily efficient, right? I mean, so in other words, if you wanted to have an efficient lower course sy uh, 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 system, uh, uh, it, gov governmental management may not be the best thing for the United States, which is a very different, as you know better than I, but a very different country than, than Canada. We won't have a single system. What I'm hoping for in the you know, whatever, if this tape doesn't get around, I have a few more years as President of Wesleyan. Um, what I'm hoping for, uh, what I'm hoping for is that uh, we can create different access paths for more students. You know, and, and we're a small place at Wesleyan, so we, we can we do small things, but it's very easy for people to save 20% off their tuition at Wesleyan and graduate in three years. Um, I, I think in a few, we should plan to have some students will be there for two years. We should educate a lot more people, and we should, ed and and we should have very high standards. But uh, you know, 30 weeks of vacation a year is not necessary, even if you call it an internship, so they work for nothing for an, a company. Um, uh, I, I do think there are lots of ways to experiment, and faculty have to do this because uh, experiment with other paths to learning the things we want our students to learn that don't fit into the standard semester that don't cost the same amount, that give different paths for different kinds of students without sacrificing the kind of liberal education that I've tried to describe. Yes. I'll look up there. Is this working? Good. Yeah. Could, could you just say a, a word or two about the possible and I think actual tension between an incentive structure, especially for junior faculty, 
that primarily prizes, privileges, and rewards publication in top tier, high ah. impact factor, nobody ever reads them except other specialists in the field, journals. You don't, have a, you don't have a point of view about this. No, no, not at all. <laughs> And the kind of education that you're talking about, because ah, at the end yes. of the day, we are all human. We do have to make trade-offs in terms of our time. The kind of education that you're talking about, which I applaud both literally and figuratively, um, is something that requires quite a lot of time commitment yeah. on the part of very smart people who could otherwise be spending that time cracking that top tier journal with that publication that's going to give them the impact factor of eight zillion or whatever it happens to be. So can you just talk a little bit about yeah. maybe how you've thought about that and how you've managed some of that tension? Well, it's, it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, because I, I, I didn't talk about the research dimension. Uh, I, I do think that um, universities is a, loca a locus for producing new knowledge uh, is absolutely critical for to their function in this country. Um, I mean, it's very obvious uh, uh, in, in some fields, uh, um, in this, uh, you know, the, the STEM fields most uh, obviously, most glaringly, uh, but it's also obvious in, uh, in places in the arts where, w uh, if not for universities, certain modes of artistic practice would, would, would uh, probably disappear or at least really be hard pressed to operate at anything like the levels at which they operate. Um, that said, um, I, I do think the um, emphasis on uh, the conventional measures of impact um, should be rethought. And we have done this at Wesleyan. This is a faculty initiative, uh, which I very much support, um, uh, that the not what we, some people on the faculty call non-traditional scholarship. Um, I do think. Um, uh, and this is more of a prejudice than an argument. I, 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 but I do think that being in a classroom with someone who's actively producing knowledge is unbelievably exciting. I mean, uh, I, and, and it's not because they're in a top journal. Like when you're an undergraduate, you don't know what the heck a top journal is. But when you're with a person who you, I mean, you feel that they are actually you know, um, pushing at some boundaries in their own thinking and not just explaining something to you. That's a different experience. If I want something explained to me, I can watch it on my iPad. But when, you know, it's like going to theater or going, when you're with someone who's actually thinking in a way that is expanding the boundaries of knowledge, whether, whatever it's about, I, I, I think that's about as exciting as it gets. You know, I'm a nerdy person, so that's how it excites me. But um, uh, and, and so I do think it, we, would be, we should not undermine the research function, but we should be less conventional about what, what, what counts as the research function. My great teacher at Wesleyan was a man named Henry Abeloff, who was, um, oh, you know Henry? No. Oh. Oh, <laughs> uh, Henry Abeloff, who was, um, you know, he didn't finish his dissertation before he got tenure. He was, uh, I said, oh, you're a perfectionist. He said, no, I'm neurotic. Um, um, and, uh, and he went on to, his, the dissertation became a wonderful book, and other, and, and other things followed. He didn't hit the conventional measures, but he became one of the founders of gay and lesbian studies. He, he was, uh, you know, and, and a miraculously gifted teacher. But I think as one of the things that made it so exciting to be in his class, is that you knew that he was actively pushing at the borders of what we know. And it was like that with Natalie Davis in graduate school and others. So um, they don't have to, but it wasn't about the name of the journal. It was about the nature of their mind. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, who, who, uh, anyone, anyone, yes, right here. You are applauding. You get to ask a question. <laughs> so you set us on a path or a path for our students to be liberated, to be active, to be engaged, uh, to Thank cooperate, and, and to instigate. Thank you. Two questions. What do we say to their first-line supervisors and their employers about those acts of instigation? And then what do we say to them to prepare them for the strength of the powers that will question mm. their intentions, their motives, mm -hmm. um, and get them ready to really yeah, that's muscle a, up that's a great on question. those questions. That's a great question. That's, thank you very much. To, uh, I don't know if I have a great answer. It was such a good question. But um, you know, in France, they'd say, 
the, the response is in the question itself. <laughs> Kari told me to say that if I got in trouble. Um, so I, I hope you realize I'm doing my very poor imitation of the really radical humorist at, uh, at Charlie Hebdo. I, I'm not always trying to be this crass um, and funny. Um, um, uh, but I think part of the educational process is helping students understand the obstacles to what they want to do. And if you teach them that the, the, the way to deal with an obstacle is to whine, you know, as my daughter says, oh, you've just taught them that whining pays. You know, I don't want to take a test on Friday. I have to go to the doctor. And you say, okay, take it on Monday. And you've just taught them whining pays. You haven't taught them how to deal with an obstacle. If they want to change uh, pol uh, US policy in the Middle East and they occupy my office, it's not really going to help very much in the Middle East. So giving them the tools to deal with the, uh, the, the government, with the military, with the employers, tools, because if they just whine or run, ram the head into the wall, it's not going to work. But that means giving students a dose of beyond the university while they're at the university. And that's that combination of wanting to both give them, as they always say, a safe place where they can, they can uh, try things out, but also giving them a sense that there are consequences when you try things out. And sometimes, you know, it doesn't work. And so, you know, Wesley, the average grade is like an A minus or something. And I have students come and say, well, yeah, <laughs> you gave me a C plus. And it's a film and philosophy course. It's not, it's not even STEM. And, and I, I, I say, well, congratulations. And I say, well, you say, I've never gotten a C plus. I say, well, congratulations. <laughs> and, say, and, and they often, often say, so what can I do about that? And I say, well, you can study for the next test. And they're shocked. They've been, because many times they've been told that, uh, you know, and so I want it to be nurturing. I want them to do the work. But I also want them to know sometimes it doesn't work. And it's hard to make change. So I had a uh, last, very quickly, I had a dance major in my office. He said, you know, it's really hard to get an internship when you're a dance major. And I, I said something like, no, 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 uh, no kidding. <laughs> he said, I, and you know, I, he, was, he was really angry. I said, get used to it. I mean, that's what you signed up for. It's, uh, we can help you try to find things. But it's going to be a lot harder for you than if you were an economics major. But that's, but you get to dance. <laughs> you get to dance. So let's figure out. But to tell this guy, well, there won't be any difference between you and the guy majoring in um, data analysis, that's, that would be a disservice, I think. Yes? Can you hear me? Um, yes. So I want to thank you because you got me all fired up about liberal education again. Um, but you know, I grew up undocumented and most of my life. And so uh, I, what I wanted to ask you is a two-part question. I'm a journalist, so I have to do two-part questions. Um, so the first question is, you know, you speak a lot about how to make various paths available. And so like, my question is, how do you make various paths um, in these like alternate paths known, available, and accessible to immigrant children, undocumented children, and uh, in just kind of like a longer kind of term strategy, like people of color? Um, and then the second part to this is like, my, my mom still doesn't get what I do. Like I try to explain to her the value of like why liberal education is important. She's like, she's not even like first gen. You know, she, she values like being a lawyer, being a doctor. She's like, you know, we immigrated when we were very young. So like, how do you also uh, work with parents to get them to understand the importance of a liberal education, especially when they're coming from immigrant backgrounds? I said those are both uh, so important. Uh, so on the first question, uh, I think that um, you know the short-term answer is allocate money to financial aid and um, communicate broadly to areas of the country, uh, at least, uh, where people don't know that, um, let's say in my case, that Wesleyan could be free for them um, and um, and offer an, an exciting opportunity for them. So. So um, that's, 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 you know, we're a small place. It's, it only ha it's, a, it's not, uh, not going to be a lot of, of people. Um, and that range, that, and that, that, like for us, that goes from partnering with, you know, we ha we've had more prep for prep students at Wesleyan, I think, than any school in the country over the course of uh, that organization's existence. And, and in the top two or, th I think, in, in a better chance students. We just partnered with QuestBridge, which you, you may do as well. It's been really a great thing for us because we also not just get students from underrepresented groups, we get students from different parts of the country who had never heard of us before 
and who bring to our campus a different cultural experience that um, makes it sometimes hard for them because, because of this uh, everything we take for granted. So many things we take for granted for them, it's, it's a chore. It's a, something to wrestle with. And so we have to be, you know, and I, I have to, uh, I've erred in that regard. I actually thought we open the doors, we get people to come, we make it really accessible, free, let's say, um, and we're done. No. Because then we have, all, we have lots of issues with students on campus um, because of radical inequality in America. Um, the campus is not the bubble it was before. Rich people like to show how rich they are now. They, they, and we have a lot of them, too. Where, you know, where when I was a student, the rich people like, couldn't tell because they were always dressing down. Um, and um, uh, that's not so much the case anymore. So I think ma accessibility and support is, is uh, as, is, is, uh, and allocating money to financial aid. Your administration, like mine, makes decisions all the time. You can increase your you know, spending in, in various areas, or you can increase your discount. And it's a choice. And you have uh, a role as faculty members. Uh, you may not want it, <laughs> because it's, it's also one of those areas is compensation. But you either you you allocate. So, on the on the broader issue of, uh, it, it you know, it, it's 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 been the case for a long time that first generation students have a heck of a hard time explaining to their parents what they've done. My my father was a furrier, didn't go to college, didn't graduate from high school except by joining the navy. Um, and when my major at Wesleyan was the history of psychological theory, uh, otherwise known as procrastination. Um, <laughs> I couldn't, just, I couldn't decide. So, um, and, and there are stories like that to go back 50, 75, 100 years, you know, that people, if you're doing your job as an educational institution, you're, you're offering people a chance to do something that their parents don't understand. And our job as teachers and as administrators is to tell the parents, gosh, thank you. You are giving your children a chance to do things you don't understand. And if you're not, then you're actually, that's just a failure. And that can be in technology, it could be in communications, it could be in just being in a liberal education environment. Um, and I, I think it's, it's not as easy as I described, of course. Um, but but I, I do think um, sharing the message about the pragmatic value um, um, and, the, um, and the, the joys of that experience, of having a broader experience, I guess that's the best I can do. One more question. There's, there's a, yes, in the corner there. It's very interesting, and I agree with most of the things you said. Um, I wanted you to comment on what I've observed as somewhat of a troubling trend. Um, I've noticed, as the parent of an elementary school child, that there seems to be an emphasis on teaching, quote, critical thinking skills at levels where it's inappropriate. In other words, kindergarten, <laughs> first grade, et cetera. And um, <laughs> by, the time, <laughs> by the time they get to college, it becomes a vocational school. So at the university level, everyone's focused on, well, do they have the skill set to get a job, and do we have employers who are going to do this, which obviously is important. But I see the long-term effect of that as being a major skills gap where they're not learning the, basis, yeah. the basic things in kindergarten and uh, elementary school, and they're learning things that they should be learning in college, whereas college has now become a trade school. So I'd love to get your um, feeling on that. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a piece in the book that uh, actually was in the, uh, in, the, in the New York Times called Young Minds in Critical Condition, I think was a, a, the title that the New York Times gave the, the op-ed piece, uh, where I, I actually um, I, 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 I question the value of critical thinking. That, you know, that that, and I think there's a, there was a session, or there's about to be a session uh, about critical thinking in, in your conference. Um, uh, and I, um, I, I do think that um, um, the, the um, I don't want to say I don't want to say fetishization, but it's a word that occurs to me of critical thinking um, uh, at, at the expense of learning things that you can work with and not just be critical of. Uh, is a d real disservice, especially to our youngest students. I, I, I find that uh, our students know they're supposed to be critical, um, and they know that a sign of intelligence is to, is to be able to not be taken in by something else. 
uh, to be able to see through something, uh, to be not fooled. And I, I think it's a, a great hindrance, actually, in that, that we also have to give our students the capacity to be absorbed in something, to fall in love with things, to open their hearts to things. Um, and finding the balance between cr the critical and the absorptive is, is I, I think, uh, a really important task. And I'm thinking maybe that's what my, I'm going to write my next book about. Um, but in those early years, I do think um, giving the students the, uh, um, the, the fodder, the material, the lumber that they will then be able to use to build or to reshape. To ask them to reshape things before they have anything to reshape seems to me um, uh, suspect, although I'm, I've, I'm not a, uh, a teacher of elementary school. But I have kids, so I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think, we, hold still everyone, please. I think we have our work cut out for us, but it's going to be an exciting road ahead. The next session is going to begin at 2.30, so you will have about 15 minutes of break, but some really important announcements first. If you did not pick up your name tag, there are two vital reasons why you should. The first is so we know you are here, because we're all bean counters, right? But much more importantly, you cannot be rent entered into the raffle unless you have picked up your name tag. So there's some good things that we have on offer for free, um, some of the best things in life. Uh, so please go to the registration table. Let us know for sure you are actually here. The dessert reception and raffle begin here at 445. In addition to some really nice food, and there'll be some music, you will also have the opportunity to get up close and personal with President Roth's book, which will be on display. I'll be here. <laughs> and, 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 and he may even sign. Now, I must tell you, having had the joy of listening to President Roth um, for this last almost hour, I was reminded of an experience I had many years ago when I saw a movie. And the movie was the earlier Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. I grew up in the Washington area, and it was being shown on a movie theater, one of these really elaborate places. I want to say it was on 14th Street, pretty near the White House. And I remember coming out of the movie theater. It was late at night. It was a long movie. And just to one side, I want to say it was to the left, but it could have been to the right, there was a bookstore. There was a religious bookstore. And there was a sign that said, you've seen the movie, now read the book. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing all of you at various sessions this afternoon, after you've picked up your name tag if you didn't already, and then for some real celebration and um, sharing and signing and conversation uh, at the end of the day. Thank you all. <laughs>